Okay, hello everyone, how are you today? Sorry to catch you waiting again uh, for so long. Uh, I've been trying to <coughs> get this thing uh, work. Uh, so I brought actually, as you, uh, some of you noticed, I brought two computers actually to test uh, which one is working. And actually I also uh, <coughs> made a reservation for another room temporarily today just in case the thing doesn't work. This flickering thing really kept bothering me and actually last week two other students also specifically uh, have commented on please do something about this uh, shitty uh, projector so I did finally <coughs> try to do something and seems like uh, it's been working right now up until now so maybe uh, I don't want to pu put any blame on my new computer Mac uh, Macintosh laptop but Newer one uh, is not, uh, does not seem to uh, co <coughs> cooperate very nicely. So old one, this is my old one, it's working fine. So, good. So we don't have to change room if this thing actually persists. That's a good thing. And so uh, let's keep the uh, fingers crossed. And uh, another thing is, uh, I've been actually so tied up with my daddy uh, these days. Uh, he's still in, uh, in hospital right now and, and things are not really good actually right now. So uh, because of that, I've been uh, uh, late uh, recently in putting up some of the recording materials and uh, some other admi administrative things. That, but uh, eventually I'll try to uh, catch up. So please uh, put a little more understanding on your side. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, and another thing is the uh, attendance. Okay. So with this, where, where are those attendance? The scrap paper, where are you? Uh, yes. So this attendance as I explained, hopefully I explained clearly uh, the other day. Uh, all you gotta do is simply just uh, turn in uh, how much, how many, twelve or ten, twelve all together of all together the scrap papers. Then you will will get uh, full ten points credits of attendance. So uh, in reality, you don't really have to too much, uh, worry too much about this attendance thing through this. Uh, the main idea is not uh, checking your attendance, but simply I'm curious about your like, input question or some of the comments, if you have any. Uh, so anyway, uh, occasionally some students uh, have a little confusion, and rightfully so, that, hey, I checked this, that official the attendance record, the module, the hey young thing, then I did attend it uh, last week and then it turned out that I was uh, like a regular absent because uh, one thing, clear thing is that hey young module is a bogus. Don't trust those hey young things uh, because that is something kind of an official thing. Uh, like I explained earlier briefly, what if you uh, skipped four or five uh, weeks all together and hey young if I just uh, put the record honestly on that hey young will automatically uh, find you and then uh, put you on the F list uh, flunked automatically because that's the university rule and specifically I stated that I'm not going to follow that university rule so I don't care about that so uh, it doesn't matter in my class even if you skipped uh, 14 weeks doesn't matter you are not going to get flunked out okay the only thing the only penalty is you are not going to get uh, you're not going to get anything for Christmas uh, you're not going to get <laughs> uh, full 10 point attendance credit that's all right so to do so what am I going to do so uh, for hey young thing I'm going to well between ourselves of course I'm going to put uh, the uh, kind of a bogus uh, fake record of everybody's uh, like a present every week. In that way, nobody, nobody will get any penalized for uh, just simply following my instruction. That's not fair. Okay. 
and I'm going to keep the real record of attendance. And then actually I finished uh, uh, the <coughs> cleaning up, uh, updating the, the most recent attendance such a record in Snowboard this morning. So if you go onto the Snowboard and then you can actually uh, check whether uh, like in my record you were absent like two times or three times uh, kind of thing check and then uh, that record if that record is not uh, consistent with your memory then you can always come to me and explain or fight or whatever where you want to okay choose it's your choice okay that's so from now on uh, anybody hopefully don't really uh, <laughs> like uh, get any a stress from the Heian record because I'm not going to really uh, diligently update those Heian records and occasionally simply uh, clean up those Heian records. Okay, that's all right. Uh, if I don't have anything else, all right. So starting uh, from early next week, I'm going to spill some of the exam questions that are actually. Uh, that uh, are going to be on this year's exam. So uh, I changed a little bit of the uh, strategy this year in that I'm going to let you know most of the questions in advance okay? so that you have. So it's kind of a mixture of uh, a little bit of a uh, heavier. By the way, who did this? So marvelous. Uh, I cannot really erase this today. And this one too. Wow. I just said shit with the screen. That is quite relevant to what we are going to cover today, too. This chemical bond things? Wow. So I don't know. I I, I thought like some of you uh, came early and then made this uh Fantastic art drawing, uh, so that like to give me a lesson, uh, but if not, fine. So anyway, uh, so this year's LSD uh, home, uh, both midterm and the final exam will be a uh, kind of a hybrid format of uh, oh, take home exam where uh, you get the answer, your questions in advance like a week prior or anything, then you work on it uh, and then just turn in. It's, that's uh, kind of a take home exam format. And I really personally love this uh, because that's uh, when I experienced those such a take home exam when I was in, in the undergrad in, in US college, I loved it because uh, you don't really have to have some very limited time uh, pressure uh, type of thing. You can freely think about it, work in it, but there was only one very strict condition that you are not supposed to work those questions with anybody else. You have to try to find any reference book and try to find the answer on your own. Yeah. But uh, Koreans, Chinese uh, in particular, those who have some very difficult, unique cultural background, uh, they're not really uh, accustomed to such strict rules. So I knew, I knew my fellow Korean students or my fellow Chinese students really didn't, didn't really uh, follow strictly that rule and they just uh, collaborated. <laughs> but that's not supposed to. And if you really uh, follow that strict rule, and then later you found yourself that oh that was really really helpful exam and while I'm trying to uh, get the answer I really learned uh, type of so I'm going to try to uh, instill install some or uh, some element at least on it in this year so instead of having the uh, what the open book exam this year I'm going to put a little of this take home exam uh, uh, type of uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of some of the questions in advance. Uh, then the exactly same question will appear on the exam. Then you can answer. If you worked, 
If you work diligently, then you will be able to answer relatively easy. Uh, and if you have been neglecting those, ah, there will be always there will be always a tomorrow, just like me. Uh, then I'm exactly the kind of type of a guy. I always uh, try something on the last minute, uh, overnight. And to me, something like uh, it's like from midnight to six o'clock in the morning is still six hours, and from <laughs> 6 p.m. to midnight is still the six hours, but for me, for some reason, I always think that from midnight to six uh, in the morning so, uh, hour is really, really great. So that uh, I always think that within that time frame, I can do everything. Yeah. And then I always realize that, oh shoot, this time I screwed it up again. <laughs> So, uh, it's your choice once again. But anyway, that's what I'm going to do. So, uh, early uh, starting next week, I'm going to one by one uh, give you a type of question uh, that uh, will be on the exam. Fine? Okay, so. All right, and the exam co will cover uh, the material until we get to cover next week. Okay, so. So today, uh, I'm going to continue on uh, this the discussion of uh, the macromolecule, but, oh shoot, it's not. We didn't even finish. What I mean, what is... We were, like, uh, at the end of this hydrogen bond uh, last week, right? So last week, what we have covered was uh, ionic bond, covalent bond, and hydrogen bond. And covalent bond was strong, okay, reliable, stable bond, so that the building macromolecule we usually uh, use, almost exclusively, almost exclusively use this covalent bond. Where, uh, on the other hand, ionic bond and hydrogen bonds are weak, uh, but still, even those weak bonds, the significance of weak bonds in biology, we will hopefully uh, be able to uh, realize today. So continuing on this another weak bonds uh, on top of this hydrogen bond. So the characteristically hydrogen bonds weakness, individual basis this hydrogen bonds bond strength is very uh, negligibly weak. However, uh, they always work with mass, in mass, uh, to be more, more accurately. So, uh, we don't really get to encounter the weak on a single hydrogen bond. That's nothing. But whenever we get to see or we have to deal with hydrogen bond, uh, we have to deal with at the same time, uh, at a time, like thousands, tens of thousands of different hydrogen bonds all together. And that mass, number-wise, will create unnegligible, really significant force. That's why, in many occasions, hydrogen bond actually play very significant role in maintaining the biology, especially the fine structural interaction of biology. So, probably we can, what we can say is, through covalent bond, we create macromolecules. Through covalent bond, we build many, many different types of organic uh, macromolecules, and then to make them work efficiently, then we need other uh, so-called so non-covalent bond, including ionic, hydrogen, and another two bonds that we are going to look at today. And they are the one actually made possible that make possible that interaction, the real, the more in, uh, important thing, interaction of these macromolecules, that's what make our life more exciting, dynamic, and uh, worthwhile. And that's exactly what it is. So, uh, acid base, I will skip that. Uh, if you are interested about acidity, acidity and, and basic things, Later, you just try to find yourself. Uh, actually, it's all about the hydrogen ion uh, concentration, uh, how strong acid is, uh, or how uh, alkaline or basic uh, any uh, water water solution is. It's all depend uh, depends on uh, the amount of hydrogen in the solution. But now, 
like this. Uh, let me present this is another very mysterious uh, band uh, pronounced as a Van der Brars uh, force. Uh, it is a very mysterious bond in that uh, it's a very quick temporary uh, chemical. The electrical interaction is unlike ionic bond, which is very uh, obvious and uh, straightforward. Ions are always ions. Ions always have charges. But we have also learned that uh, polarity. So I'm sorry, I have to erase this, but. This polar or non-polar thing, so even in the case of covalent, covalent bond, some covalent bonds are non-polar, that's originally they are what uh, uh, they are supposed to be, but in some occasions this covalent bond can create some polar interactions because of their uh, very uh, subtle, uh, unstraightforward, the subtle underneath interaction, attraction uh, for Electrons. That's what the, this polarity happened. And example, best example was a water molecule, wasn't it? And and because of such water molecules, polarity uh, as a byproduct, a hydrogen bond uh, was created. Okay. And so those hydrogen bond, once they are uh, <laughs> in our world, uh, we cannot really ignore the uh, strengths of hydrogen bond. And similarly. This Van der Waals force is something like this. Uh, so let's imagine there are two different uh, molecules. It could be an element or molecules, either way. And to make uh, this thing simpler, let's imagine this is a simple element. Okay. And in an element, electron will uh, spin around uh, the surface of a element. But the position at any given moment, the position of this electron is not going to be uh, staying uh, at the same position. Electron will just keep moving. So if you try to take a snapshot of these two elements sitting together in very close uh, distance, like at one moment, at one snapshot, probably one electron, uh, and one electron is close to this surface, whereas another electron of this molecule is moving away from this interacting surface. And then what happens? A partial, partial charge. Just like the similar partial charge we have seen in the case of the water molecule's hydrogen bond occurrence. And partial charge can occur, theoretically and realistically. Okay. And if this partial charge uh, happen over here, what happens? The attraction will be built between these two molecules. Once again, of course, this partial attraction is very, very temporary thing. Okay. Because they will just keep constantly moving around. At any given moment, we cannot even predict correctly and what exactly, what what exact time point this electron will come here and that electron will go away so that the, the, uh, the attraction will uh, happen over here. We cannot even uh, predict precisely. However, it's there. And because these electrons move so rapidly, and it is such a the continuation of this uh, connection and this connection, connection and disconnection, for us, this is as good as there is a still there constantly, this attraction is still there. Formed and broken and formed and broken, but it's just so temporarily uh, happening and broken and happening broken. So it is as good as simply staying there all the time. That is, obviously we can understand such force will be very minor, uh, weak bond, even weaker than the hydrogen bond, of course. However, it's there, and if this two surface area try to make a contact, 
just like this pointed area, then the area of such interaction, the opportunity, will be smaller. However, uh, if you imagine that this two surface area, larger surface area, and then the opportunity of such electrons have such attraction because of their random movement will be greater. That's the very unique characteristic of this Van der Waals force. So one thing, there are two characters, particular characteristics of this Van der Waals uh, force. One is very weak, temporary things. Another thing is, the larger the surface area of these two contact, so the Van der Waals uh, force will happen only if these two elements or two molecules are close enough, very close enough, but not too close so that they have, hey, don't, don't come too, uh, too close, I will just uh, repel you, but there is uh, some very, very fine line between. So when they approach so close together, and then this attraction can occur to everybody, anybody. It's not like ionic bonds are always only, only ions can participate. So those poor elements who can never be an ion can never think about any, who oh, can I have any ionic uh, interaction? No way. Don't even think about it. A covalent bond is also only certain element uh, who are capable of both donating and exchanging and sharing electrons on their valence outermost can have. But this Van der Waals interaction is for everybody. Anybody? Because any element has electrons and their electrons are moving around. And when they are, the only condition for those two Van der Waals force participant is when, only if they approach close enough so that they can make, induce this Van der Waals attraction because of their random electron movement. So it is a real, uh, I'm not, it's not any kind of imagination, but it's there. Uh, already scientists have witnessed and confirmed the existence and the effect of this Van der Waals force, and that's really uh, significant. It, it, it is very important in maintaining biological, many biological activities, uh, actually. So, mm. so this is what I was uh, talking about. If they uh, approach <coughs> in very close distance, like this, and then this Van der Waals interaction can occur. But on the other hand, if they just approach even too close like this, and then instead of attraction, the repulsion, Van der Waals repulsion will occur. Hey, don't go away, type of. It's just like uh, the human nature, too. Uh, so, and another thing is, With the same amount, the same uh, number of carbon and hydrogen, but when they have a larger surface area, so that they have a larger area of this interaction, and comparatively, the Van der Waals force is greater. How do we measure the Van der Waals force is greater or sm smaller? By measuring their relative boiling point. It's the boiling point, the higher the boiling point, that means they have a stronger bond, a bond holding these molecules together. And the actually same molecular weight okay, uh, components have a different boiling point depending on the different surface area of a contact. Proves that Van der Waals force requires larger contact area of uh, compatible, comparable uh, surface. We call those comparable surfaces as complementary. Their 
surface are complementary. So that one is this round, the fist shaped, and the other one uh, surface area was uh, like this, this shape. And then we can, we can we can consider this interaction as a complementary shape, uh, just like that. And larger complementary surface area is uh, the one that uh, facilitate enhance this van der Waals force. So, uh, in summary, this force is once again is very weak in terms of the strength. Cannot even compare. Think of this comparing with covalent bond. Okay. How can how dare can you compare your strength with me? No. However. It is biologically very significant. In what way? Show me. Like this. Antibody antigen, everybody uh, these days especially, uh, hopefully, understand um, the significance of this antigen-antibody interaction, right? Uh, without it, uh, we could have uh, suffered a little more miserably uh, from coronavirus. But thanks to this antibody, quick antibody development, uh, we could uh, significantly lessen uh, the impact and basically this any antibody capture the specific target we call the antigen antigen is antibody specific target so antibody will grab this antigen and then uh, make this thing helpless usually because this usually the antigens are part of the pathogens infecting the surface of a bacteria or virus or some other nasty thing. So that's how we uh, uh, evolved to survive from all those outside uh, those enemies trying to get us. Uh, and another thing is very similarly and also more important in perhaps is an enzyme and substrate. The substrate is the enzymes. Each different specific enzyme is a specific target. So always enzyme and substrate interactions are very specific, unique. As an enzyme A, I can only recognize you and you only. I cannot see anybody else, but only you matters. That's the interaction between, relationship between enzyme and substrate. And how this specific interaction can be possible, of course, Van der Waals force is not the only chemical bond enabling this, but main, main bond. So together with Van der Waals force, probably some, some other different enzyme or antibody will employ ionic bonds too, or in some occasion, hydrogen bond too. Okay? But Van der Waals force, uh, uh, whenever you, we looked at it, this uh, such a weak Van der Waals force uh, has been turned out to be playing the major, one of the major uh, player. And receptor ligand is something very uh, similar to this type of interaction in that usually receptors exist usually on the surface of a cell. If this is a surface of a cell as a cell membrane, usually the receptor in the form of protein resides over here. This is one specific receptor. What do they recept? This specific receptor, let's say it is a glucose receptor, and this receptor protein can only recognize and bind this glucose. So in that way, this receptor know, okay, there is a glucose. And send the signal, hey, we have a plenty of uh, glucose out there, type of. That's what these receptors do. And a lot of those pathogens, not, uh, notoriously viruses, uh, take advantage of this receptor. Uh, and this specific component we call as a ligand, the target. The receptor ligand interaction virus uh, take advantage of and then fake that as a one specific recept or the receptor's target and then try to make an entry into the cell. That's how viruses usually uh, infect the host cells. So all these interactions, important interactions, uh, underneath, the, basically, the Van der Waals uh, are there as a providing such a 
fundamental mechanism. So this is the uh, structural model of the antibody trying to grab, capture this antigen. Uh, and one interesting, uh, very surprising thing is, uh, one of the lizards uh, whose name turns out to be a uh, gecko lizard. Uh, it's, uh, so popular uh, in the uh, the American, uh, like uh, North American, uh, the, the areas you can see them uh, in occasionally in many uh, areas. And this, uh, what's special about the gecko or lizard is they can climb up uh, any very nice, clean, like a glass type of a surface, vertical glass type of surface wall. They can climb up without any uh, special shoes or anything. Help. Their, their foot are uh, such a special device enabling such a climbing things. How? So as you can closely look at the, at the bottom of this foot uh, of the gecko lizard, it and this is uh, created to, uh, it is designed to create uh, such a really tight interaction, intimate van der Waals force interaction with the glass surface or any other water surface. So they are actually generally uh, generating the van der Waals force and then with that, they can uh, climb up. Uh, I really personally just wish to learn the me uh, mechanism so that I can uh, the, apply this thing in actual commercial uh, shoes or anything like that so that we can also mimic uh, their ability of climbing on the, the vertical surface just like that. Uh, it's so amazing, marvelous thing. And the principle behind this, the magic like uh, their activity is simply weak van der Waals force. Wow. Okay. So, uh, another very important weak interaction is uh, this is finally hydrophobic interaction it is not even chemical bond up until now how, how many different chemical bonds have we seen since last week ionic bond covalent bond hydrogen bond and van der Waals force four right four chemical bonds we have looked at and they i advertise those four as a uh, biologically very important chemical bonds. Okay. And finally, the last chemical, such a chemical bond, but uh, I said this is not even the real chemical bond, but we rather uh, put the name as an interaction, hydrophobic bond, no, but rather hydrophobic interaction. Because it is not something that, unlike the other chemical bond, like provides some like long-lasting, stable uh, attraction that through which two parts uh, they can be hold, held together. But this is a simple the phenomenon of uh, close make those two parts close together is what we call the hydrophobic interaction, and it happens in the specific environment of life, which is in the water. Okay. That is a, a starting point, unfortunately. All life forms began in the water. In other words, the, all those materials present in life have to learn to deal with the water. Okay. Because we are surrounded, virtually surrounded with water. That's why I try to mention the, the hydrophilic versus hydrophobic the other day, in, in the last week. Whether, uh, try to find, try to determine uh, any given molecule uh, is going to be, is it going to be hydrophilic or is it going to be hydrophobic is something important. Okay. Uh, why, uh, as one example, lipid, okay. that cholesterol, cholesterol is as a lipid, is a hydrophobic, but the cholesterol is made in the liver and it has to be transported, delivered through our blood. But unfortunately, our blood is basically water, right? 
So this hydrophobic, water-hating, non-polar cholesterol, how can be delivered? So that's why uh, our cell came up with LDL. I'm going to explain a little bit about this LDL in the break because uh, one student had a question about this LDL. Uh, but anyway, that type of uh, adaptation is necessary because of this specific environment that we live in, watery environment. But another thing is this. In this aqu aqueous, watery environment, any non-polar molecule, there are lots of uh, non-polar molecules. One example, those are cholesterol. Uh, are also made, uh, especially those non-polar molecules, uh, as part of a protein, usually uh, happen. Let's say uh, my entire body is uh, one entire single protein. And protein is a uh, very interesting, uh, unique in that in entire surface of protein, uh, some area is hydrophobic, some other areas are hydrophilic. And then, once this protein is born freshly, yeah, like a baby fresh, uh, baby protein was born. Now, there is hydrophobic area like this, non-polar, and there is other hydrophilic area. Yeah. And it is just automatic thing. Once they are born, automatically, because it's in the water, and this area will try to, whatever it takes, it will try to avoid contacting with the water, this hydrophobic area. So it will fall. Right? Because that is the best way to avoid the contact, interaction with the water. So proteins, let's this is an original protein. And this original protein will automatically fall into some its unique shape depending on where is your hydrophobic area present. And that's how this particular unique protein's shape is determined and parenthesis automatically. Spontaneously or automatically, usually. Usually, not always, I said. So this folding thing is due to this specific phenomenon we call as a hydrophobic interaction. This hydrophobic surface area will try to get together. Why? Because by doing so, let's say these are all water molecules and some of, some of the hydrophobic molecules are there and when they cluster together, that's how they can reduce, they can minimize the contact area with the water. And that's because of that, this molecule, hydrophobic molecule, will uh, clump or get together naturally, spontaneously. This is another uh, such a cartoon illustrating the principle of hydrophobic interaction in that. Let's say these areas are all hydrophobic surface of any given molecule, and in the water, this area, instead of exposing this area okay, to all this water, nasty water molecule, the best thing uh, what they can try is to get together like this. Then so that they can exclude the water coming in at least this area. That's the principle and reason of the hydrophobic interaction. So any non-polar area, any molecule having this large non-polar surface area will do that, automatically, naturally. And we call, oh, that's why they do that? Oh, because of the hydrophobic interaction. Why? Actually, there is a reason uh, why, uh, through this the thermodynamic uh, explanation, by doing so, they have the most stable uh, structure, and so that by doing so, they have the highest entropy value. Okay. Uh, so this is all about the entropy thing, but we don't have to really dig into such entropy. 
I think. If you are a chemistry or physics major, uh, go your own territory or major and then study for those entropy things. Not here. I'm not going to. Uh, so, so this aggregated contact area is So this happens, this aggregation, this happens thanks to such nature characteristic of hydrophobic interactions. But the question is, can they last? So this is just a phenomenon to, in the course, of, during the course of avoiding, avoiding the water molecule. However, another matter is, how long can they hold over here? In order to hold this area, they need some kind of specific chemical bond. But unfortunately, hydrophobic interaction per se itself is not a chemical bond. It's just a phenomenon. But here, a lot of textbooks are misleading, is misleading you, well, are misleading you in that uh, they are using this uh, hydrophobic interaction and hydrophobic bond as interchangeably. But, but no, to be more accurately, hydrophobic is not a chemical bond. Simply it's a kind of interaction. But then who is the one? Once they have this, once they have this open to this type of situation, then who will hold this thing for, uh, for kind of a long term uh, status? Is what? Guess what? When they have this, remember something? Large surface area. And this surface area looks like what? Complementary. Right? Then everybody, anybody, are they an ion? No, they are not. Because they are hydrophobic, non-polar molecule. They cannot be any ion. If they can be any chance of becoming an ion, then uh, they couldn't have been any hydrophobic or non-polar molecule in the first place, right? So, then what else? What is a possibly one possible uh, chemical bond that can happen over here? Ring a bell, anything? Van der Waals. Van der Waals, because they are close together. And they have very complementary large surface area. Whenever these two things are met, then it will happen. Did I say? Did I say? Van der Waals will always happen like that. So, yeah, if that happens because of that hydrophobic interaction, then next thing, the rest of the thing, I will take care of you. Don't you worry. And then Van der Waals force will come now. Okay, that is the thing. So, once they have this aggregation through this hydrophobic interaction, then the Van der Waals, this Van der Waals force interaction, the Van der Waals force will take over will, and maintain such interaction. So they are actually tightly linked, this hydrophobic interaction and the Van der Waals, uh, the bond are tightly linked in this way. One thing is, Van der Waals force can happen to anybody, including like polar, non-polar, anybody. Okay. But in the case of this hydrophobic molecule, the Van der Waals force is the only chemical bond they can rely on to have any such interaction. Can you distinguish those two things, hopefully? So this figure try to illustrate what kind of force are there once they have this hydrophobic interaction through this surface very close together and each area Van der Waals force is established and then maintained it. And this hydrophobic interaction, like I try to have some stupid action and with also folding of a paper too, and it is very important determinant for protein structure. 
And for us, protein structure is extremely, extremely important for life science because protein structure will dictate any given specific function mediated by protein. And protein's importance as uh, well, we can easily see in the example of all different enzymes and receptors and antibodies and you name. So, let's say one protein was made and some of this hydrophobic area, rather than being surrounded by this water molecule, the best thing for them is to get together like this through hydrophobic and once they have and the van der Waals force will okay, maintain this aggregation and by doing so the overall protein specific shape like this is determined created so we don't really have to worry too much about uh, what kind of this protein will make what kind of a form it will have the automatically uh, already determined is their fate because of the their specific area of hydrophobic surface and this hydrophobic interaction also portrays many many different occasions of so-called pathological uh, the diseases a lot of diseases actually uh, a uh, 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 result of protein aggregation involved in each respective cases. One case in point is this. Uh, nice, nice regular red blood cell. And white, so obviously this must be a white blood cell. This is a real uh, the elect uh, electric microscope, so they are real, it's not an artistic uh, presentation, the real po uh, photograph. And, and what about this? Why is this? Some red blood cells don't look like a really nice little uh, semi donut shape, but have this crooked shape, right? This is called the sickle cell. Sickle shaped red blood cell and this sickle cell anemia, uh, perhaps one of the very, uh, most famous examples of such uh, mutation and resultant disease. Probably a lot of you also must have heard in uh, your high school or in any, every biology textbook as uh, well uh, described uh, this uh, sickle. So red blood cell, there is a mutation in the hemoglobin. What is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is anybody knows who? Anybody knows what? How do you say? Sorry, I'm French, so I don't have the word in English. Why don't you speak in French? I love it. <laughs> Uh, the red cells, yeah. uh, they make the heat, uh, they stay together in the blood, so that's why you see them, and they flow in the liquid, uh, we call hemoglobin. So that's hemoglobin, okay, give me, yeah, basically you're right, good, thank you, but give me a more straightforward answer in that hemoglobin, is it molecule? Oh. Is it molecule or not? Hemoglobin, what is it? It is. Mm -hmm. It's a macromolecule. Well, macro uh, what did I say about macromolecule? There are only four types of macromolecule, right? Mm -hmm. Carbohydrate, protein, lipid, and nucleic acid. Which one is it? Hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. Is it nucleic acid or lipid or protein or lipid? Let's start with that one first. Hemoglobin. The hint? This. Anything ends with IN. You better actually, uh, you better bet this must be a protein. Protein usually, uh, in, yeah, it is. Usually, the, a lot of the different protein names actually end with IN. 
So hemoglobin, so oh, that must be a, some kind of protein. And you are right. Yeah, hemoglobin is a protein. Okay? Hemoglobin is a protein. And what does it do is the more important, more relevant question. What does it do? The what? Transfer oxygen. Yeah, thank you. Transfer oxygen, right. So this is the guy. Without this guy, we cannot survive because thanks to this, this is an oxygen carrier. Grab the oxygen and travel uh, all over the uh, entire uh, our body through blood vessels, okay? And so that we can get the supply of oxygen from the air to this the traveling of red blood cells. So this hemoglobin is only present inside of a red blood cell, right? There must be a gene. Yeah, of course. If this is a protein, then there must be a, so a gene linked to this particular gene. So this gene will be responsible for making this protein, hemoglobin, right? And there is a mutation in this hemoglobin gene. A sequence, a very subtle, minute change, like substitute. Like we have some students, and one student skipped the class, and instead uh, she called her friend and sitting over here. And That's what happened. So usually it doesn't, it wouldn't really match up, usually. Because we have, like, in many usual classrooms, we have like several hundred students attending enrollment. And out of these several hundred students, only one student okay, uh, skipped the class and then instead, actually, instead of leaving this, uh, the seat empty, but uh, she was really good enough so that to call on a, a friend and then, hey, why don't you sit over here uh, for today? That's what happened. That's the nature of this mutation for this so-called the response for this sickle cell anemia disease. So mutation of this hemoglobin gene. And, but unexpected and very unfortunate, uh, the uh, grave consequences occurred in that total hemoglobin structure. It got screwed up entirely. That's really, really, really unusual thing. Hey, this is a several hundred different students all together making one hemoglobin, uh, functional hemoglobin protein. This is only one student. Identity has been changed. So it shouldn't matter, but it mattered in this case. Unfortunately, it's a very, very unfortunate case. And it matters in, to the uh, point of usually hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is nice uh, roundish globular uh, protein structure, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is like this. Because of its particular area where the hydrophobic uh, thing is, so they will fold naturally like this. We call this type of protein as a globular protein, roundish globular. Yeah, that's hemoglobin. And this hemoglobin will capture oxygen and travel uh, through this blood. That's how we get benefit from the, the good work of this hemoglobin. But this mutated gene creates hemoglobin of this. It's very... Probably you're not going to get any scrap paper today because I use up all. <laughs> and individual hemoglobin protein link one by one and put huge fiber rope-like hemoglobin Original hemoglobin shape is like that, and this mutated hemoglobin have this long fiber-like hemoglobin of a connected one. What happened? And obviously, this connected hemoglobin cannot function normally, and they will sit, sink. They will sink inside of this red blood cell, 
And because of that, even the shape, entire shape of this red blood cell is changed. Because the mature red blood cell, uh, uh, some time ago I mentioned, even they don't even have any nucleus. All they have is a whole bunch of hemoglobin protein, that's all the mature red blood cells. And if all these hemoglobin proteins are like this, and they will obviously sink to the bottom, and such red blood cell is useless. Not only useless, but it will create all the interference in all other major uh, circulation related uh, procedures. That's why it is create not only some specific disease, but the entire collection of disease uh, causing for this lack of blood, anemia. Anemia is like designation, representation of lack of blood. So this is really serious, 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 serious illness. Uh, anyway, so those are the basis of this uh, mutation. But why? What in the world? This is something is to do, has to do with the protein structure and with the hydrophobic interaction. In the first place, this. Normal hemoglobin uh, looks like this, globula. And sickle cell hemoglobin, mutated version, aggregate like this. Why? Because normally this area, the hydrophobic part is not exposed. Because during this protein folding procedure, this hydrophobic part will fold inside and the surface is covered by other guys who can deal with the water, the hydrophilic surface. So all these surfaces are actually occupied by hydrophilic part of a protein. And if you want to find the hydrophobic part of any given protein, you better dig internally inside because they are buried already so that they can avoid this. But this, how dare you are just exposing yourself. This, because of this substitution, this hydrophobic part become exposed at the wrong position suddenly and the entire protein building structure thing cannot do anything about it because it is a, such an unexpected thing oops what in the world are you are here and the problem is now this hydrophobic surface is exposed then what can happen this will panic Hey, I am hydrophobic and what about what about this whole this water guys? How can I avoid these guys? So they improvise their hydrophobic interaction on the surface. Usually this hydrophobic interaction will be created internally, but this hydrophobic wrong surface, the only possible they can avoid this being disaster for themselves is to cluster themselves, so like every gate, so that they can hide. They can hide each of this exposed hydrophobic surface. That's why all this bunch of long fiber-like hemoglobin protein is created and then sink to the bottom. That's a huge disaster, unfortunate thing. But if that was this only one very isolated instance, Okay, fine, tough luck, too bad, good luck. And then we just uh, uh, mind, uh, we are back to minding our own business. But the problem is, this is same paradigm uh, also found over and over again in the case, for example, Alzheimer's, some particular uh, associated protein, uh, this deform the structure, create this huge precipitation aggregation in the nerve neuron cell, and the neuron cell is destroyed because of that. Parkinson's too. That particular other protein, related protein, structure is changed 
And because of that, this singular hydrophobic interaction creates this aggregate of that related protein and the neuron cell, uh, depending on this dopamine thing, uh, are destroyed. And because of that, Parkinson's disease will occur. And even diabetes too. Some specific protein has this very similar way of a hydrophobic interaction and aggregation. So the insulin creating a specific type of cells are all destroyed like that. So same thing, same principle, same thing. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, once we pinpoint this reason in, at the molecular level, probably somebody will uh, have to do something about it to correct all these things in in general way. That's uh, the value of uh, understanding the basic principle of all this the chemi chemistry and molecules uh, underlying all the different interactions. Okay. Ah, uh, why am I getting so slow like this? It's already six ten and. I haven't even started this four major molecules. I have four more or five more minutes, okay? So let's give it a shot. So there are four major macromolecules, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acid like this. And I have shown already this uh, <coughs> slide last week. And, and all these Common characteristics of all these macromolecules are they are polymers. Polymers. What's polymers? The relationship between polymers and uh, monomers. All polymers were built starting from monomers. In other words, for each of different categories of major macromolecules, there's got to be some specific monomers with which each different macromolecules uh, have been built. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with this the brand name Lego? None? Lego? So, they're not familiar with this the terminal is a Lego block. That actually struck me the other day, several days ago, we were watching TV, and a guy was uh, mentioning, and I always thought about this was, everybody knows this Lego block, with which you just build uh, some specific toy structure, like a robot and ship and airplane, using one small piece of a brick-like block. What do you call it in Korea? I thought always, for a long time, I thought in Korea too, they call this as a Lego block. Actually, this Lego is the name of a company <laughs> that sold this small block. But there was some specific other name he mentioned on TV. And uh, he actually, he was in his 40, mid 40, but he was still in that, uh, the building toy building using the small brick-like things. And I forgot, I forgot how uh, the name. So anyway, I hope everybody understand this Lego block thing. Uh, so using this small individual piece unit as a monomer, you start building a larger and larger molecule. That's how you end up building any polymer. Monomer versus polymer. Why uh, I am emphasizing this? Monomer and polymer. So, as an example of this polymer, we get to uh, cover carbohydrate, lipids, and protein, and nucleic acid. Uh, they are all polymers. Okay. But all of them were made starting from building, piecing together, piecing each individual monomer together. So there must be some kind of magic okay, over there. How do they end up starting from monomer? How do they end up this polymer? Obviously what? Chemical bond, of course. 
What kind of chemical bonds? Anyone? What kind of chemical bond would they have used? Starting from monomer to build this polymer, all these four major molecules. Covalent bond, of course. So all of this, regardless of type of different um, biological macromolecule, or they have utilized covalent bond. That's it, covalent bond. But here the, uh, the issue is, in particular, what type of covalent bond they are going to use is this. A specific type of covalent bond we call condensation. Condensation, condense. Sounds like you are extracting. Condensation is what? It sounds like what? It sounds like you are extracting water is condensation. So you, you, you try to make things dried up. And by doing so, you are building one specific covalent bond. It's another common thing. So, without any much ado, probably try to digest this figure. It's probably not much better. Here, several monomers. And four of these monomers were put together to have one mid-sized polymer, right? Monomer, monomer, monomer. How right. So in doing so, you have to, you have to draw each covalent bond in between each of these monomers. What type of this covalent bond is that? Is this. Like, let's say there are two monomers. You want to connect these two monomers. Here, how can I do that? Easy. You just simply draw one solid line, right? And kick out one water molecule in between. So in other words, these two monomers better have a capability of donating all together at least one water molecule so that they can kick out one water molecule. This is what we call dehydration or condensation. Is one type of covalent bond. So there's one OH and there's one H, so all together H2O, so water is out. So by virtue of kicking one water out, you can now establish very stable covalent bond in between. So that's what we call condensation. So the important thing about here is, okay, this is one type of, this is one example of covalent bond and Specifically in this occasion, one water molecule is extracted. One water molecule is kicked out, and as a result, covalent bond is formed. So, not only you just finish it over here and up, but you can keep going on. Oh, it's, it's working, so let's do it again. As long as there is a room, for extracting one water molecule in between, of course you can repeat this. So you can keep doing so to build huge polymer. In the beginning, there were only a couple of monomers, but every every different polymer of biological macromolecules were born in this way, starting from certain specific type of monomer through condensation reaction. Even carbohydrate, proteins, nucleic acid, lipid, all together, they have used the same condensation reaction to build their own specific polymer. How do I, how do, how do I get any refund? I changed, I have changed my mind, I don't want to. Uh, be, uh, exist as a polymer. I want to go back to monomer. As long as you return to me your receipt, then I will, I will put you back into the monomer status. Is what it's going to. What is the receipt? The water, right? 
So as long as you can add water back, then this covalent bond can be broken. And as a consequence, this polymer can now be separated into two individual monomers. So that type of reaction is called hydrolysis. Hydro. Hydro, water. Lysis is breaking. So that's why the Korean for hydrolysis is called exactly, literally, literal translation of hydrolysis, which is kasu Yeah. So that's the opposite, exact opposite of this condensation reaction. Through condensation, you build the polymer. Through hydrolysis, you break the polymer back into the monomer. That's exactly what's happening in our inside of our life, in the cell. That's what we call, or that's the part of metabolism. Okay, uh, probably if I continue on, probably somebody will kill me. So uh, let's put, uh, let's take 25 minutes.